Welcome to this session about your finances, uh, what to do, what not to do. I'm glad to be joined today by Omar from Windmill. Thank you. Happy uh, to be here. Welcome to Toronto. Appreciate it. I know you're coming from uh, Ottawa, not yes. far away. Um, windmill, uh, I've uh, worked with many Windmill uh, staff and they're across the country. We are. Um, Ottawa, Calgary, Vancouver. We've got someone behind the scene from Vancouver right now. So uh, welcome to Toronto again. Thanks, uh, it's, uh, I'm happy to be uh, joined today by yourself just to talk about the first step. Remember, and uh, like in my office right now, we were talking about this first step that any newcomer to Canada uh, is facing. I'm in Canada. What's next? What do I do now? Um, and specifically, when we talk about healthcare providers, uh, these are like high scale people, high pay, um, like people look up to them. And all of a sudden, they're in Canada, they put a, a reset on their own. They know nobody, right? So we're trying to help them at least on the, on the financial part. That's right. To many newcomers, this is a new area. So um, let's talk about what they what they care about and from from your experience, uh, what you think they should avoid um, when they navigate through this journey to becoming healthcare provider once again in Canada. Yeah, um, great point. Uh, let's take it back a bit. I think for newcomers, when they come to Canada, once they have the ability to settle with their family, get housing, get their kids to school, now they have to think about work themselves. And if they are healthcare workers from their country, first they need to get their credentials assessed, uh, credential recognized. And in Canada, we know, you and I know that it could be first complicated and also very costly. So they have to think about financial options for them to do so. And with thinking about that, they need first information. Information is key in Canada. And for a lot of newcomers, that information is sometimes hidden. They don't know where to find it. So they have to come to resources like Rep Doctors, Windmill, and other settlement agencies to support them with providing them that kind of information. Exactly what do they need to do? What kind of steps they need to take uh, to get back into their profession? So once they have that kind of information, they need to think about the cost that is associated with getting their credential recognized. And once they have a clear idea about the cost, now they can start with the second step, which is planning. When am I going to do that? How am I going to do that? And if it's expensive, um, am I going to finance that? So I think these are some of the key steps that they have to follow to be able to do so. Absolutely. And uh, like talking about people who have not yet landed in Canada, you can start ahead of time. You mm -hmm. can start doing this at home. Absolutely. You can start uh, like um, looking at your options, budgeting, planning, even with the certification. This is something you have to start at home if you're planning to uh, to proceed with your career in Canada. Like in Prep Doctors, specifically for dentists, we provide the consultation service for that certification part because everything takes time in Canada. That's right. Um, your, uh, your application for, for the NDEB, for the dentists, um, it can take you six months, nine months to get a reply from them. You, you do not want that reply to say, you missed this document complete the, the, the application and apply again one more time, right? Yeah. The earlier you start, the better. Um, and as you say, if you can start even while you're waiting to come to Canada to get the process started, to get all the information you, you want before you get to Canada, because it's much better to start that process earlier than later. Also because of skill fade, you don't want to spend too long in Canada without actually working uh, in your profession. So you want to be able to do that uh, and you want to be able to to have that information um, as early as possible so you can get started with the process and understand what is required uh, for you to get started in your profession. Right. So if we talk about budgeting, yeah, um, I know for Windmill, for example, since I joined Prep Doctors, when students wants to apply for a loan uh, to Windmill, there is a requirement that you have to have a budget in place. That's right. And doctors know nothing about budget. <laughs> so I used to say, okay, uh, I can help you out with this. Just bring it on to me and, and then I'll, I'll help you out with it. But if, if we can provide them with a, 
like a high level idea of how this should look like in simple terms for them, uh, what to avoid, what to, uh, what to look for in their budget, what they have to include in their budget. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, you have to consider um, all the costs that are associated with getting recertified. Um, first, there's certainly costs with associating with getting your files with the regulatory body, getting that assessed. There are costs associated with having the exam. Uh, there are costs associated with doing some prep courses, which I think is very, very important and almost a necessity uh, in some cases, specifically uh, with dentists, because we see that the uh, the pass rates significantly increase when people do the prep courses. But at the same time, I feel like sometimes, and for the newcomers that we talk to, sometimes they forget the fact that you have to take the time to study. You can't just walk into the exam room and expect to pass. Sometimes you need to take time off from work uh, to sit down and actually study. And that could be three months. That could be six months. You have to plan for that if you're not making income uh, during that time. And you need to be able to include that in your budget in addition to the cost of uh, the prep courses, the cost of the exam, the cost of assessments, uh, and any other costs that are that associated with it. So I feel like sometimes people forget to, to think that you need the time to actually prep for the exam. And that's a very, very important part. Exactly. Well, you nailed it. Uh... I was talking to a friend of mine who happened to be an AFK student now, uh, going back to studies again. He's a newcomer to Canada, so he's a typical case. And he was like, before I started AFK, I used to talk to my uh, fellow uh, dentists. They're like, AFK needs a lot of time and you have to study. And I'm like, it's not that bad. Uh, like, I'm, um, yeah. uh, he's working in some part-time job right now. But then once he started, the, the course goes on and prep doctors for... Friday, Saturday, Sunday only. So just three days a week. But once he started, he's like, man, this is a full-time thing. I can't, I can't do that part-time job anymore. It's time consuming and I have to study if I want to pass. That's right. So that's what they, they underestimate sometimes. You need time to study. Whether you take courses or not, you have to put in time to study and you have to factor in that in, into your budget. You cannot do a full-time job. Yeah. And I would say also, um, that's why we talked about starting early in the process early that allows people uh, to plan and start saving um, for uh, the courses and some of the costs that are associated with it. So in terms of budgeting, you need to start thinking about some of the costs in your life that are not necessary. So at some point, you're going to have to tighten the belt a little bit. I, I hate telling people to do that. But this is the cost that is associated with getting recertified. It's almost an investment into yourself. So you need to think about some of those costs that you can cut so that you can reinvest them, the, the, the funding somewhere else. And of course, we're going to get into it. Uh, there's financial support that Windmill can provide um, and prep, do prep doctors could advise you on how you can properly finance the course. But there's certainly an aspect of uh, thinking about some of these costs that you can start cutting to save some money because you, you're going to need that buffer. You're going to need um, some funding set aside uh, for you to be able to survive while you're studying. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's essential. And uh, and that's one of the things that people struggle with in Canada, especially newcomers, would say from some parts of the world, uh, the lifestyle is different, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the faster you get into the Canadian system, which is in that aspect, I think is great. Yeah. You don't need to, to show off. You don't, you don't need to be fancy. To be able to live within within the community, yeah. Um, like whether you make a thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars, your neighbor is your neighbor, yeah. And and, and they won't, people won't tell the difference, right? No. So that's a, that's a key thing that people has to stay away from. And as you said, uh, you have to do what you have to do. You have to start cutting costs early, so you can save some money and go through this journey. So if we talk about uh, financial aid, sponsorships, uh, scholarships uh, that they can have, bursaries, uh, what are the main things that you see newcomers um, missing or not taking advantage of? One thing I would say, because that's a, a bit of uh, my area of expertise, because I work very closely with governments, I feel like there are so many government programs out there that can support newcomers, and most of the time they don't know about Right. Um, so that's why I was talking about that first step is access to information, knowing which program is available, which aid you can access and applying for those. And sometimes 
newcomers need support with that hand holding, kind of showing them how to do that because those processes could be complicated. And sometimes we're leaving uh, support on the table and governments turn around and say, well, we have this support available, but nobody used it. So we're going to cancel it. That's just because people didn't know about it. So I think as a newcomer, you need to make sure to uh, to ask, um, talk to your advisors, uh, talk to people in the community, go to settlement agencies, talk to people like Windmill. And as, as a matter of fact, we are a government funded program, uh, which we can uh, support you as well. So these are the type of things that I think are available that newcomers uh, can access. Yeah, I, I usually advise people just to ask. Just ask. Doesn't doesn't hurt to ask, right? So wherever you are, just ask, 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 and all of a sudden you find doors open that you didn't even realize that they exist, right? That's right. Uh, one of the um, uh, one of the best resources for newcomers, in my opinion, is the newcomer centers, all over the place across Canada, and uh, almost everything they provide to newcomers is free. So why not take advantage of it? That's just right. go and ask them whatever you want, but no harm. Just ask and you might find it over there. Or if they don't have it, they'll just guide you on where to do it, where to find it. Yeah, they're a resource center. So if they can't provide you with the service that you need directly, they can provide you with information, all the resources that you need, whether it's financial support, whether it's support for your kids, for your family, health support, mental health support, all of that is available. And for financial there are some financial supports that are available. And as Windmill, our organization, we've for years had an issue with people knowing that we actually exist. We provided services that are transformative for most newcomers, but pe people didn't come to us for lack of information because they didn't know that we existed. We've done such a better job recently into making sure that we're advertising properly, marketing properly, working with partners like uh, prep doctors and others to inform them about the existence of our services that are supported by government that will help newcomers keep costs low for them, provide them with the financial resources that they need. But not only that, also information like career guidance, financial literacy, which we're discussing right now, and also mentorship. Put them with professionals and people in their community, in their field, to help them navigate the labor market, which is very, very important uh, for somebody who is new in a new country, right? So Yeah, I think mentorship is, as you said, it's very, very important. Yeah, uh, It makes a big difference. And that's another thing that newcomers are not uh, familiar with. It's not common everywhere in the world. Yeah, that's right. That's For me, that was a new thing in Canada. But it really makes a difference when you find someone expert in your field to take your hand and guide you on what to, what to do and not like to avoid the mistakes that they have done. Yeah. Themselves, yeah. Right? Uh, one of the um, main financial aids, I would say, that I see newcomers uh, taking is FCR. Yeah. So, we talk about FCR a lot, but what is FCR and how, how can they uh, get an FCR loan? Yeah, the, the, so the FCR is a foreign credential uh, recognition loan program where a, a newcomer who is looking to get re-licensed or re-accredited in their profession, especially healthcare, there's a focus on healthcare uh, with the FCR program, can access a low interest or sometimes no interest, we can get into it um, after for them um, to pay for the cost of reaccreditation and relicensing. So all the costs associated with them getting back into their professions is covered. So that's uh, the exams, the prep courses, the assessments. Um, if they need to put their kids in daycare, for example, because they need to focus on studying, which we discussed, if they need to take time off, all of that could be included. And that support is provided to them for them to be able to get back in their career. And this is a government supported and government funded program, uh, which allows organizations like Windmill to continue to keep costs low, to continue to keep interest low to newcomers and provide them with all the resources uh, they need to succeed. Yeah, well, let's, uh, let's talk about Windmill in that aspect. Yeah. Um, uh, can you give an idea of like what OneMail provides uh, and uh, what services are not tackled with OneMail? Like you want people to take, but they they don't know about it and they're not taking advantage of. It. Yeah, that's right. So OneMail is an organization uh, uh, that provides. Um, first of all, our mission is to support labor market integration uh, of newcomers in Canada. So we help them getting back into their profession, getting accredited, getting their licensing back. And we do this by providing low interest 
loans or no interest loans, we can get into it with uh, the program that we have specifically with private doctors uh, for them to pay for the cost of relicensing, recreditation, career change, or professional development uh, for them to get back in the career. But over the years, what we saw it's not just the financial support that newcomers need. They need other supports as well, in addition to the financial support. For example, career coaching, like access to that information. It's very compli complicated, the process of accreditation, and you know that for dentists. So newcomers need to know what steps they need to take to be able to do that so we can provide them with that as well. Uh, financial literacy, people make mistakes when they're new to Canada. Financial systems are different from around the world. So when you come to Canada, you can get into the vicious cycle of using credit cards and not knowing how they work and getting into that cycle. So we provide them with financial literacy. So before we give you a loan, we want you to understand the basics of finance. What is interest? What is principal? Uh, what is what is everything that's associated with taking a loan? We want you to make sure you understand so you're not making a mistake. You you know what you're getting yourself into. And finally, we provide newcomers with uh, mentorship. And this is a service that has been in existence since 2005. Uh, we actually started uh, very grassroots in Calgary. One of our founders was a clinical psychologist. She worked in the hospital in Calgary and she worked night shift. And she quickly discovered that many of the cleaning staff that worked in the hospital were actually nurses, doctors, but they couldn't a practice in their profession because their credentials were not recognized and didn't have the financial support uh, to get back into their careers. And the hospital where she worked was actually like, there was a shortage of nurses, shortage right. of doctors. So she thought it didn't make sense. So she took action and we've grown to become this organization, but we still continue to have issues with people knowing about our services, mm -hmm. getting that information and coming to us uh, to access our services. So um, yeah, what I see from uh, like my experience with the students, that sometimes they mix up windmill for uh, a regular bank. And I keep telling them, the first thing I tell them is, look, windmill is a charity. That's right. It's not there to make profits. It's yeah. there to help you out. That's yeah. their that's their goal, right? So so it's way different than any other uh, institution, financial institution. Now, when uh, sometimes that someone might just uh, go into any bank, and they simply ask for a loan, and the bank would say, "Yeah, well, here are the documents. Just sign here, and you get your twenty thousand dollars." And they sign, and then next day they find out they're screwed, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, this happens a lot. So things like the literacy that you talked about, this is not something you check off with your eyes closed. You have to pay attention and you have to know um, everything that are around credit cards and loans and how it works in Canada before you get in, uh, yourself into something that you you can't opt out of. Right? Yeah. So, I think we're, we're very, very different from uh, a typical financial institution. A financial institution in general, the conventional ones, are motivated by profits. That is their motivation, right? So we're not. We're a charity. Our mission is really to help newcomers before anything else. So we want to make sure as we're providing them with the financial support they need that all other supports that is available um, for them to succeed. So we want to make sure they are well equipped uh, before uh, taking a loan with us and also succeeding. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, John was talking to me one time. John is the financial uh, director. Yeah. Financial director at Windmill. Um, he was like, we want to fix the, the interest rate because interest rates are going up the variable and it's uh, driving people crazy. And because of that, we're making more money. So we want to pay that money back by fixing the interest rate. So it's <laughs> actually the other way around. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So, yeah. Now, talking about uh, credit maintenance, this is, again, another brand new area for a lot of newcomers. Myself, it was like I knew nothing about what is credit score, yeah. credit history. This is a new area. Uh, it's way different the way that Canada deals with this. Uh, the I, I feel the, the system puts it more on your shoulders if you don't uh, maintain like good uh, or healthy spending. Yeah, habits. Yeah, habits. Then, then it's your fault. Yeah, we're not going to go after you in, in courts and cops not going to come to your door because you didn't pay the bill, but we'll just put a a, a dot on your uh, on your credit score. Yeah, that's right. And then that hurts you more. It does. Right. It does. Yeah. Uh, can you talk uh, a little bit about that? What What do you see? That, what common mistakes do they do with the, with the credit scores? Yeah, I, I think one thing is people before taking a loan, 
don't understand the loans. And that's for us, it's very, very important that people understand the loans before they take the loans, especially with credit cards. It's very easy to use, but most people do not understand the principle behind that. It's important to pay the credit card on time to make the minimum payments because all of that is reported to the credit bureau, as you said. And once your credit score is impacted, it's going to hurt you in the future. Uh, it's going to hurt you to find, to, to get a new rental apartment, for example, to buy a home, to buy a car, to start a new business, right? So these are all important things that people have to understand and not make the mistakes that a lot of newcomers are making so that they can, they can avoid that. So it's very, very important before you get into signing for a credit card, you get into signing for a loan, you understand. Uh, what is the APR? What is the annual percentage rate that the, the credit card offers? Um, what is the interest that I'm going to pay? What are some of the principles? What are the terms of the loans? What's going to happen if I don't make the payment on time? All of that. This is very, very important to have, have all of that information before getting into it. So we avoid uh, hurting our credit score. And the good thing about Windmill is that we assess uh, newcomers loans based on credit score, but also like we support people with no credit score. So if you lend it today in Canada and you come to Windmill with zero credit score, we can still support you. And while you're studying and you, um, you are, uh, prepping for your exams and you're, you're making payments to Windmill, we report that to the credit bureau so you can build a credit score. By the time you're done, you have a very good credit score. Now you can go on and, and, and uh, make uh, buy a home, for example, and have a good credit score to do so. So um, it's very important for people to avoid these mistakes. Yeah, talking about uh, reporting to credit bureau, um, a common thing I see is I see people come to me saying, I use my credit card, but then my credit score is not going up. So a common thing they do is use the credit card now in five minutes, they pay off the, that credit card, use it, pay it, use it, pay it, same day, same day, same day. And they think they're doing themselves a favor. But in fact, this is not working because the credit bureau is not getting nothing about you. You're paying up right, right away. So they're not getting any, any information. Feedback. Yeah. So uh, I see that the, a better practice for people that wants to pay off right away is to give it a couple of days. Just give it three, four days and then go pay it off. No problem. What I do personally is to provide the pre-authorized instructions to my bank. That's right. So if I forgot to pay it and I have money in my account, they'll just take it and I don't get uh, hit by uh, by high interest rates. Uh, credit card interest is, is one that you want to avoid because 20% is killing. It is. Yeah. Like... Uh, I don't want to say last resort. It shouldn't even be the last resort because the going into debt with credit cards is something you don't want. You don't want to do. No. Yeah. yeah. And you know, most credit cards um, offer a grace period. That's why it's yeah. important for people to know you have you you spend today, then you have twenty one days usually with no interest to pay. So within that period of time, if you wait a few days for the, the, your balance to actually be reported to the credit bureau, then you can start building that credit and that history because the next month that balance is going to be reported at zero, which is going to make your credit score increase. So you have that I don't know, three weeks uh, buffer for, for you to make the payments. And it's very important during that period of time to actually pay uh, the credit card to avoid the high interest that the credit cards are uh, charging, right? So, right. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that I see people uh, like falling for is uh, shopping credit cards. Uh, whenever you shop any anywhere, they'll, there will be someone coming to you uh, offering a free uh, shopping bag yeah. and, uh, or a gift card or a cup of coffee and just get a credit card. It costs you nothing. Well, it, it costs you a lot. <laughs> it's not, yeah. That's not free. And the, the $10 that you're getting now, it's going to cost you a lot more headaches later on trying to deal with this. So don't just sign up for any credit card you see in the market. Be aware of what you're signing up for. Yes, you can have one credit card, two credit cards. If you want to have more credit cards, it's up to you. But I personally don't recommend it because you, you have to be in control. Uh, one credit card that you uh, you forget about and then they send you to collection. That one, four years later, it can prevent you from getting $350,000 from any bank in Canada. That's right. So that's, that is serious. Um, I mean, I, I see that with uh, with our students as well. They don't recognize the uh, the risk of 
being sent to collection by anybody for just a $50 that you're struggling with, uh, with Rogers, for example. Yes. Brazil. Yes. It's a $50, but that $50 can put that black note on your credit score. Seven years. Seven years. And that one can, I've seen people going through this. Once you become a certified healthcare prof professional, any bank in Canada would be happy to have you as a client and give you $350,000 of credit, no question asked. Except if you have that $50 on class. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. These are the type of pitfalls and mistakes that new, a lot of newcomers make. Uh, collection is very, very serious uh, in Canada. You, got, you have to do as much as possible to avoid going in collection. And sometimes the companies will actually, you call them, they will listen to you. You can make payment plans. You shouldn't be afraid if you don't have the money currently to pay the whole amount. You can always negotiate with your bank to avoid or the cell phone companies or any other companies to avoid uh, going into into collection. And you talked about the, uh, the store credit cards and the shopping credit cards. Usually their interest rates are much higher than even the bank credit card. So if a bank is charging you 19.99% for a credit card, the store credit card at Walmart will be 29.9%. So the interest is much higher and the chances that you will forget and not pay the credit card are, are higher. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. But if you're a person that is organized and wants to have multiple credit cards and you know you're paying them on time and you're building your credit score and that gives you a bit of flexibility, then props to you. But for most people, you should definitely try to avoid it and make credit cards a last resort thing. The general rule is that if you don't have the money to pay for something right now, don't use your credit card to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. yeah. And to your point, I mean, talking to whoever you owe money to, is essential. I, I, I find yeah. that uh, interesting in Canada. As long as you're talking, they're not going to take action. No. So just keep talking to them. Just don't ignore them. I see that uh, with the CRA. <laughs> yeah. I, I've worked like in taxes for, for the last 12 years or so. Yeah. So I just tell people one of the biggest tips I give people, do not ignore the CRA. When you ignore them, they go crazy. Uh, and that that applies to banks, to every every yeah. everywhere in Canada. Yeah. Just don't ignore them. Just talk to them. Yeah. Okay. Talking about um, long term financial planning. Oh yes. Uh, when they when they finish their exams, every student, every newcomer looks up to that moment where they get their career back. Mm -hmm. Right. For dentists, it might take them two years, three years, depending on their like uh, their process. Um, nurses might be a bit uh, faster, physicians a bit longer. But once they reach that point, what what is the if there was one advice that you want to give them? What was what would that? Be? <laughs> I would say congratulations first. That's a great moment for a, like a lot of newcomers in Canada. And now your income potential has increased significantly, right? You got to think about that um, for especially for healthcare workers like dentists, doctors. All of a sudden, your average income can could, could be like could be in the six uh, figures. The mistake that people commonly make is to start making big expenses overspending because they think they're going to have the money to pay for it. And in the end, you could be very, very soon burdened with a lot of things that is over what you're going to make. And you, you're making the same mistake as when you were a student. So you want to take the time to start making money, saving and planning for the future rather than going to overspending, buying a home, buying a, a the, the, the car that you always wanted and all of that. You want to wait a little bit, work, uh, get experience, save some money, and find and plan for the future, which is important. Yeah, I I, I always tell them to uh, like, you passed, just take a brief, sit down. This is your first day in Canada. <laughs> this is your <laughs> first day. In Canada. Yeah, yeah, right. So, uh, uh, and uh, as I told you, what, a couple of my clients, once they pass, they run into uh, into a Tesla. All of a sudden, man, you you didn't even work yet, so. Just take a breath, relax, and don't do not overspend. As you said, overspending is uh, is a killer. Yes. Another great uh, great advice would be to keep your cash. If you've got some cash, you finished your equivalency, you're now certified, and you do have cash. Yeah. Then you better keep the cash. Do not pay off 
the loans that you can wait on. If they're not asking you for payment right away, keep the cash and plan it wisely, right? You always have to keep some cash aside. You never know. You never know what happens. Like, right, your car might break down and all of a sudden $7,000 payment. Yes. Boom. So keep the cash. Do not overspend. Do not get a spend rush. And, um, and do not rush to close the loans if you don't have to. Yeah, that is very good advice. Um, you know, typically financial advisors and planners will recommend that people keep at least three months of expenses in cash for emergencies and things that um, you don't know are going to happen, which could be difficult for a lot of people. But that's why if you have loans that you're currently paying and you have no issue making the monthly payments, continue to make the monthly payment. And if you want to pay off loans, you have to prioritize. So you need to start looking at interest rates. So credit cards will probably go on top of that list, right? <laughs> you would want to pay those first before going into other loans that are less. Uh, the interest rates is lower and the, the amount is a bit higher so you want to make sure that you plan and prioritize re, uh, regarding to that and for sure you need to start uh, looking for work right, uh, right you yeah. know uh, yeah. get 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 build your connections uh, go to meetups uh, build a network uh, talk to people get a mentor uh, at windmill we will certainly help all our clients to get mentors um, to support you into uh, finding a job so yeah, you can start your careers in your career in Canada yeah I, I see our students take advantage of the mentors because um, in prep doctors we've got about 30 35 uh, give or take um, certified dentists working with the students um, about all of them have been students of prep doctors so and newcomers to canada so they've gone through the same process exactly yeah. um until the until the finish line these are great mentors that you can you can take advantage of um again talk to them um and um and they'll guide you they they know they know what you've been what you're going through yeah. and how you can get get away from it talking about work I always tell them to uh, go to less competitive areas. Don't try like heart of Toronto or heart Vancouver uh, for a job. It's true. Uh, you, yeah, you might be lucky and find a job there, but you're, um, you have way more chances in rural areas. No one is going there. And they pay like crazy. <laughs> they do. <laughs> I, I thought of changing my career. Like, what am I doing here? There are so so many benefits, and I understand. I have been a newcomer in Canada. We all want to be in the major urban centers. This is the Toronto, the Montreal, the Vancouver, is because this is where you got the community, you got the food that you want, you got everything that you need culturally speaking. But people don't consider the region, the rural communities. First of all, housing is cheaper. <laughs> yeah. um, it, it's, uh, income could be higher. There's less competition, so you may you may get hired uh, quicker. And if you're a dentist, you probably be the only dentist, uh, so your income potential is all of a sudden higher. And I understand culturally speaking, and for uh, inclusion, all of that, the cities are better. But people should definitely consider the region and government. The government across Canada have all kinds of programs and supports and financial support to, to encourage people to go in the region, especially in the healthcare sector. Sometimes they'll pay up your student loans just because you decided to go work in the region. So that's an important consideration that many newcomers do not look into. Uh, but the cities are crowded, regions and the rural communities are open. Yeah, and that, that can give you a real boost financially yes. in a couple of years. Uh, as you said, government is helping. Yeah. Local authorities are helping. Yeah, and the uh, and the private sector, your employer will be helping as well, mm -hmm. just for you to go work in the rural areas. I was uh, working. I was talking last week with uh, with the uh, recruitment director in one of the biggest uh, corporations in Canada that owns hundreds of dental clinics, talking about creating some placement jobs yeah. for our students. And the first thing he told me is encourage them to work in rural areas because that's that's where that's where the the real need is and that's where the money is believe it or not yeah so um now if we talk about um career advancement um now they've uh they've got their uh 
that equivalency, uh, they started working. Um, do you do you what, what feedback do you get from them after getting certified? You've helped a lot of dentists and healthcare workers um, go across this this journey. What is the feedback you get afterwards? Um, they certainly need support uh, to get a job and to get employed. Um, but I think also once they are in the position, people need to, const to be constantly learning. Technology is advancing. The process, is, the process of doing things are advancing very quickly. Now people use computers more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So you got to keep up with the technology. And that's something that you need to continue to invest in yourself. So you got your certification, you got a job. That's great. But you need to continue to keep up with your profession. You need to continue to keep up with the technology that's advancing all the processes, the new processes that are happening. So you need to continue investing uh, into yourself and plan for the future. Yeah. Uh... Um, for my side, for uh, I always think taxes because that's that's my work, right? So I tell them um, you gotta have an accountant from day one when you're certified. Yeah. Second day, look for an accountant. Don't go for the for a fancy accountant that charged you five thousand dollars or something. You don't need that, but you need an accountant who knows what they're doing to guide you through. You're not an accountant, you're a dentist. And from my experience, dentists are not that experts <laughs> with that. So, uh, so yeah, um, get yourself an accountant and plan ahead for yourself. Yeah. Every step of the way is different and is a new step for you. Don't think that you know what you're doing ahead. Again, there is no harm in asking. So even if you know what you're doing, keep asking. Ask every single professional. Um, about uh, what to do. Um, the, it's, a, it's a long journey for dentists, for physicians, for other healthcare professionals, but it, it pays off. The yes. investment is, is, is really yes. worth it, right? Yeah, I've, I've seen um, clients go from, um, as you said, cleaning hospitals into being doctors, in that same, same in that same spot, mm -hmm. I've got clients who struggled through this dental journey, but then now they are clinic owners, um, and they make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. like contributing back to the uh, to the society. So it pays off. It takes a lot, a lot of work, a lot of money, of yeah. course. But there is a lot of help available for you. Just take advantage of it, right? Yeah, I mean the the, the return on investment is huge um imagine like you're investing 20k 25k into um your recertification and and, and your exam prep course and your income potential increases significantly for dentists is like over 150k the average the average salary and if you compare that to the median median in income for canadian which is in general around 70k so you're like high much higher than the general population so your income potential is very high that's why it's important to put to prioritize this, start early and put all the resources on your side so you can succeed and actually start practicing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And once you uh, once you're done, you're certified. Again, any bank in Canada would be happy to have you as a client. That's right. They won't ask you questions. They just want to see your certificate. Yeah. You're a certified dentist. That's it. We deal with you. We give you all the support, all the credit you need. You want to buy a house for sure. Preferred rates. You want to buy a clinic. We'll help you out buy your clinic some of them go i've seen them go up to 100 percent financing for clinics which is which is crazy uh so, so uh, do everything wisely yep. um don't sign anything that you don't understand mm -hmm. ask questions keep asking questions um and uh wish you all the best yeah, and don't overspend. <laughs> yeah. Don't overspend. If you want to start by uh, like getting a piece of advice, yeah, we're available. Windmill is available. All it takes is just go on their website, right? Yeah, our website. You can find us uh, on our website. We'll be available to provide you all the information you need. And if you meet one of our uh, staff and outreach uh, partnership uh, staff at events, you can talk to them as well through uh, Prep Doctors. Uh, they have uh, a quick, uh, we're a quick phone call away from Prep Doctors, so that they can you can reach out uh, reach out to us anytime. Yeah, and same here at Prep Doctors, we do provide financial advice, and we do provide advice for the NDEB certification as well. Um, 
everything is free. Everything we talked about here is free. That's right. So take advantage of it. Even if you think you don't need it, it's free. Take advantage. And uh, we wish to see more dentists within the community. Perfect. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. Appreciate it.